Before I get started, I wanted to mention that this episode of Ask a Spaceman is brought to you by my friends at Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands, that's right, thousands, which is a lot, of inspiring classes for creative and curious people much like yourself. You can explore new skills, you can deepen existing passions, or you can just get lost and learn new things because learning new things is super fun. For example, like freelance and entrepreneurship classes, web development classes, productivity classes. These are things that I can find useful and you can find useful too. For example, there's a class called Pricing Your Work, How to Value Your Work by as a Freelancer by Peggy Dean. As a freelancer, it's hard to set prices like how much of an is an hour of your time worth or how much when you create a design, how much is that worth? When you write something, how much is that worth? Especially when people want your stuff for free all the time. I know you're watching this for free. I get it. That's part of the deal with, with YouTube and I have no problems with it. Happy to make these for free. But like other people... When they want like an hour of my time, how much do I charge? This class helps. Skillshare is curated. Specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads. There's always they're always launching new classes, and you can stay focused and follow follow wherever your curiosity leads. It's less than 10 bucks a month with an annual subscription. Now, speaking of annual subscription, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description right down there will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Now, speaking of exploring creativity, let's talk about how to get a PhD in astronomy or a PhD in astrophysics or a PhD in physics or something spacey related. Not all of you know this. I have a PhD in physics. I got it from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2011. My dissertation is available online. I don't quite remember the title. I know it was about magnetic fields and clusters of galaxies and involved black holes and all that stuff. It's available. You can read it. It's there. I got a PhD and I get a lot, a lot, a lot of questions on from people of every age. Like, how do I do that? I want to prepare, I want to set myself up, or I want to move in that direction. How do I get a PhD in some sort of space-related field? Now, I will tell you that PhDs in physics are much, much more common than PhDs in astronomy. Typically, astronomy departments are going to be smaller. There's going to be fewer of them. They won't admit as many grad students. So, for example, Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, had like 10 astronomy students every year, like five to 10 astronomy students at tops. Well, the physics department admitted like 60 physics students every year into the graduate program. So you can certainly end up as an astronomer or an astrophysicist by getting a PhD in physics. And you can, but the reverse is usually not true. You're usually not going to end up as some sort of physicist if you enter an astronomy program. So just if you want to be an astronomer, don't necessarily focus on PhD programs in astronomy. You can go into a physics program and you can get have a career in astronomy just fine. Or especially if you're interested more on the astrophysics side than the pure observational side. The journey starts in high school, and I don't want to say that to stress you out, It's not like you have to plan every single course and every single move with the goal of getting a PhD in physics or astronomy. No, 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 no. I just say that's where it starts. It starts with trying to take some math classes in high school, as as advanced math classes as you can. Physics and astronomy, these are sciences. Science uses mathematics at all levels and all stages because it's mathematics through mathematics mathematics that we understand the universe. So you can't do science without involving mathematics. You don't have to be spectacular at mathematics. I do not consider myself the best at mathematics. Certainly many of my classmates in undergrad and grad school and many of my colleagues are better mathematicians than me. So it doesn't require you to be like some absolute genius in mathematics, but you you should have some level of acumen with it, some level of skill. And you want to test that. You want to do that in high school. So you're taking like calculus classes in high school. You don't necessarily need to take physics classes. I would strongly recommend taking as many computer science classes as possible because guess what? You're going to end up as a as a computer programmer. More on that later. And then you apply to undergrad. 
And you can go to a variety of undergrad programs. There are the big name schools uh, in terms of research don't necessarily have the best undergraduate teaching programs. So really just you just try to get into as good of a school as you can that fits with your needs and your likes and your interests. You know, you're not so much worried about building a research career yet. So you just get into a school and you get an undergraduate degree in in physics or astronomy or engineering physics. You know, just just something along that path. Towards the end of your undergraduate career, uh you will try to get some on some experience as a researcher. So a faculty member at your university might hire you for a summer project. You can apply for the National Science Foundation if you're in the U.S. The National Science Foundation's research experience for undergraduates. Uh, there's, there's, you're going to try to get some experience. You don't need to write a paper. You don't need to be a leader of a group. You just want some experience doing research, taking things out of the classroom and getting some real world experience. A letter from an advisor in an undergraduate research position is going to carry you very far in graduate school, in applying to graduate school. So towards the end of your undergraduate career, you are going to start applying for graduate schools. You will also do something, you will take a test known as the GRE, the graduate record exam. There'll be one part of it, which is like uh, basic math and basic language skills. And you'll have a score that no one really cares about, at least in terms of physics. And then you have to take a special physics section of the GRE or graduate record exam. When I took it 10 years ago, this oh, 15 years ago, sorry. Um, when I took it, it was a set of 100 questions, multiple choice. And it's supposed to summarize everything you should have learned in under, undergraduate physics. It is a very, very, very tough test. You will prepare a lot for it. And your score determines like what kind of graduate schools will look at you. It's, it's uh, not exactly the best system, but it is a filter. So if you don't score very high on the GRE, a lot of schools are going to turn you away just because it's an easy way to filter out a lot of applicants. You're going to apply to as many graduate schools as possible. You can have a research program in mind. You can also not have a strong research program in mind. I just knew when I graduated in physics with a bachelor's in physics in 2005, I just knew I wanted to go into grad school. I wanted to earn a PhD. I didn't know exactly which field of physics I wanted to go in. I was debating high energy physics, astrophysics, cosmology, uh, but I wanted to get into as good of a school as I could. Now, this is where a good school really matters. For undergraduate, it's not so critical because you just want a good education and you want to get your feet wet. For graduate school, you do want to get into as good of a graduate school as possible. Uh, top ranked, large Lots of faculty, lots of interest. The larger the program, the more options you have and the more flexibility you have. So you get into graduate school. Most graduate schools, you have one or two years to pass some sort of qualifying exam to make sure you can stay on. It, some are phasing it out. Some are maintaining this. I had to take a qualifying exam uh, to maintain my graduate student status. Uh, this applies both to astronomy and to physics. Now, in graduate school, you're probably going to have to pay for an undergraduate education, especially in the United States. Graduate school will be paid for. Your education, your tuition and fees will be paid for, and you'll also get a stipend because in addition to taking classes and learning how to be a scientist, you're also going to teach. You're going to teach a bunch of engineering students how to do physics. Uh, you're going to be the warm body at the front of the classroom to regurgitate all those basic physics formulas uh, to teach those undergraduate engineering majors. It's part of the deal. It, it, it's what makes physics programs uh, able to be uh, offered for free and even compensate you. So you'll get you know, a small stipend, you know, somewhere around $20,000 a year. Your graduate education will last somewhere between five and seven years, typically. You'll only take classes for one or two years tops. The rest of the time, you will be doing research. You might have to teach that whole time. 
that you're in graduate school in order to pay your stipend. Or if your research advisor has research funds, they can hire you. Or you can win a fellowship that pays for your graduate studies and your graduate stipend. Uh, if you don't have access to those, you will have to teach the whole time you're there. And largely the last, I would say, four years of your graduate school, you're really in an apprentice program with your mentor. So your first year, you find a potential mentor, you find a research project, you, and you get to work. And then you spend four years as a junior researcher in some larger group learning the ropes. You go to conferences, you'll do all the things, you'll hopefully write some papers, and then you write your dissertation. You defend your dissertation, which is largely a formality nowadays because your advisor won't let you go in front of a committee to defend your dissertation until you're sufficiently capable of defending your dissertation and being an independent researcher. If for some reason you're not cut out for a research career, if it's just not fitting, your advisor, your university will find ways to to gently walk you to the door, so no, no feelings harmed. After that, you enter, uh, you're not quite ready for a permanent position yet, so you will enter what's called a postdoc or postdoctoral research fellowship or appointment. This will be a two to five year long position somewhere, somewhere else other than a graduate school, and you'll do independent research. You know, with this, with a particular team, with a particular project for two to five years, and then you'll do another one somewhere else, and then you'll be a candidate for faculty positions or permanent research positions uh, somewhere else. So by the time you're in your mid thirties, that is when you will actually be settling down into a long term career with a secured position. That's the general outline for you. At every stage, all you're really doing is focusing on this stage and how to advance to the next stage. So when you're an undergraduate, you don't worry about postdocs. Uh, when you're a graduate student, you don't worry about faculty positions. You're just working about doing a good, you're focusing on doing a good job where you are and then competing as best you can for the next stage. Uh, good luck because there are hardly any jobs, but that's another video. Thank you so much for watching. Go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to keep supporting this show and uh, like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you next week.